Your stories don't define you, how you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief story maker of Elkins Consulting. If relationships are the key to happiness, communication is the doorway, and communication is most engaging when we use stories as a foundation. We share stories for many reasons to persuade, to entertain, and to connect. But what we sometimes forget is the impact of the stories we tell ourselves. Whether you're sharing personal stories or business stories, how you share them makes a difference in how you remember them and in how you're being perceived by the people you're interacting with. In this series, you'll hear stories that will resonate with you. You'll nod your head in understanding, and then we'll dig into the lessons from each of those situations. When I'm working with clients, I remind them to listen for understanding, not necessarily to respond. But during this podcast, I'm asking you to listen to consider your own related stories, to listen and consider which stories in your life might have impacted you in a similar way. I met Arminda Lindsay a few years ago through LinkedIn, and I was so impressed by the way that she clearly defined her boundaries. She seemed to really understand the value she brought to every conversation. So I reached out to her to talk about how we value ourselves. Well, hello, Arminda Lindsay. What a treat to get to have a conversation with you. Thank I'm so you. excited for this. <laughs> Me too. Yay. So just as an introduction for our listeners, um, I asked you to speak on the topic of valuing ourselves because a few years ago when we first connected, you and I had a conversation about how we decide what we charge for our coaching sessions because I was having a hard time understanding my value and what I brought to the table. This was a few years ago, and you said some things that really resonated with me. So that's why I asked you to talk uh, to me about this topic and share some of your own personal stories with it. Beautiful. So first things first, tell us something that other people might not know about you that isn't widely known. Oh, <laughs> so fun. that yeah, so that people can get a better feel for your authentic self, and so when people look up your website and decide to hire you as a coach, they'll have a little bit more personal understanding of what drives you. Okay, what drives me is dancing. I am an avid swing and blues dancer, and have been dancing for wow, um, my whole life. I've been moving, but specifically in the swing and blues arena for over 15 years. Wow. That is something I didn't know about you. And it, it makes me smile because I immediately envisioned you dirty dancing in the movie. Oh, totally. Dirty dancing. Me. Yeah. Cause when you said blues, jazz, swing, yeah. that's immediately where my mind went. And I can that's totally imagine place. you doing that. <laughs> a good place for the mind to go. Yeah. That's yes. That is all of that is me. So I get life, the quite literally life when I get on the dance floor. I try to go once a week and, and I notice when I don't go, it's what, it's what fills me back up. It just gives me this, oh, it's just remarkable. I love dancing. It's where I am. It's like all of my self-expression comes out on the dance floor and, oh, just being at one with the movements of my body and just it's just the most gorgeous thing to experience for me. I love that. And I'm not surprised by it. I'm totally enthusiastic about it, but I'm not surprised by it. So when I see you next, we'll go dancing together. Oh, yes, we will. <laughs> and, and yes, <laughs> I'm already imagining what that's going to look like. It's going to be a blast. <laughs> and there might be some whiskey involved. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can have the whiskey. I don't drink. I've never had oh, okay. alcohol. That's something It'll just else people be me, may then. not know about me. I don't drink, but ha happy to be with you while you do some shots. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm a sipper. <laughs> I'm too old for shots. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I digress. So um, thank you for sharing that. That is, it definitely puts things in a different, more visual perspective for what we're going to talk about. In fact, in fact, I just remembered this. There is a video of me, I'm pretty sure somewhere on my website, um, and I'll give a link to it if people want to see it, but there is a, a video of me dancing, um, just this happy dance that I did in my living room a couple of years ago to one of my favorite songs by Kermit the Frog. 
And <laughs> it's called Happy Feet is the name of the song. I love that song. <laughs> it's a great song. So I did this whole like just impromptu dance routine that I totally made up. And then I posted a video of it. So um, me soft shoeing um, in my living room because I love to tap dance too, but I was doing it in soft shoes. Anyway, I'll give you a link if anybody wants to see. That will be great. It's so, not blues or jazz <laughs> or swing, but it is me dancing and moving and having a marvelous time. <laughs> so for our listeners... There will be a blog post associated with this podcast, and I will be sure to include the link to Arminda dancing to Kermit the Frog singing. Done. Because we can't do any better than that, can we? I mean, Pretty much not. No, life doesn't get better. <laughs> the, the topic that we need to talk about is something that a lot of people, it will resonate with. And it doesn't matter, men, women, children, teenagers especially, I think it's a really, really important topic because we all grapple with how we value ourselves and how we express that value so that we don't have to define it for others. How do we demonstrate it so that others value us? And we'll start with your story um, that you kind of alluded to in a previous conversation about a, a job that turned sour. Can you share that story with us? Yeah, and I think before I talk about the job, let me set the stage for coming into that job um, because that it, I think it has even more significance. Um, I was in an abusive marriage and it was not a physically abusive marriage. And I just want to establish this, that no, no abuse lives in isolation. So the primary form of abuse in my marriage was sexual. And there was a lot of verbal, emotional, and mental abuse that accompanied that. So that's what I mean when I say no abuse lives in isolation. So I was conditioned for many, many years in that marriage uh, of being abused and just simply being smaller and not experiencing myself as valuable and, and worthy until I did. And that's its own story, but I want to set the stage. So I left that marriage. Um, I had a three and a half year old at the time, and she and I left and moved um, and started, I just, you know, I started a new life and found myself a couple of years later in this job. And it was an amazing job. And I had been there for many years, worked myself up. I was in a management position and was doing everything that I needed to do. And one day I recognized and found uh, that I had made a really big accounting error in my reporting. And we had lots of reports that we were filling out on, on a regular daily, sometimes weekly basis. I discovered an error that I had made that was, it was significant. It was not an insignificant amount of money. So I want to like be really clear. And I was aware of that. And the day that I discovered it, I was horrified and I was there, it was like nine or 10 o'clock at night. It was a very late night. I just was there trying to resolve this, trying to sort through and figure out how I could fi fix this. My boss ended up still being there. I didn't realize she was still in the building when I walked down the hall, visited with her, shared everything with her, told her what I had found. She said, you know what? I really thank you so much for bringing this to my attention. She said, it's been a long day. It's late. You need to get home to your daughter let's get here first thing in the morning and I'm going to help you. We're going to get this figured out, but let's, let's get some sleep and I'll see you back here in the morning. Great. So I went home, went to bed, got back in there early the next morning. I had not been in the office. I don't think half an hour and I was back at my desk working on it when I got called into the, the, the big boss's office and I walked in at his summoning. I went across the hall to see him. And in the room seated were the two ladies from accounting. And I immediately, like, I was like, oh, they know. <laughs> of course they knew. Um, they had, how could they not? Like, the reports had all come out the day before. Everybody had seen the same numbers that I had seen. So here, here was this kind of reckoning. But I had not been forewarned of this. I walked into the office, and he just lit into me, just verbally just started just up and down. Just It was kind of horrible. And they were horrified. You could see the looks on their faces. They were just mm -hmm. horrified and embarrassed to be sitting there and to be witnessing this um, berating, this public berating that was happening of me. And 
I was also had this vantage point of where I was standing that out of my peripheral vision, I could see the doorway through which I had just walked, but the door was wide open because he hadn't even suggested, please shut the door, please sit, none of that. And three more people came in to talk with him during the time that I was being publicly berated. They each kind of quietly exited because this, it was just humiliating. And I just stood there the whole time thinking, what, what is happening? Like, this is just horrible. It's just this, just, but every cell in me was just so shrunken. It was just, I just felt so bad. Anyway, public beating finished. I left the office. I just, wa- I just quietly walked out of the office, across the hall, back into my office, shut the door and sat down in the middle of the floor, crisscross applesauce, sat down in the middle of the floor and just wanted to kind of just be present with myself and kind of check in with what just happened. What am I feeling right now? What, am, what are my next steps? Um, how do I want to resolve this? Like, how do I want to handle or do I want to like, what, what do I do? And as I sat there and I had a lamp on the desk that was the only light on, I didn't want to have that big fluorescent on and the overhead. So it was kind of quiet, had some quiet music playing. And I sat there and I thought, what is this feeling inside of me? And in a few minutes, I realized I recognize this. I recognize the way I feel so crummy right now. And the reason I feel so crummy is because I recognize, oh, this is abuse. I'm familiar with this. I know what mm-hmm. this feels like. I spent five and a half years of my life experiencing this every single day. And in that moment, Sarah, it's like the lights came on inside of me. And I went, oh, oh, this is abuse. And I made a promise to myself that I would never knowingly allow myself to be in a situation where someone else had authority and power over me in an abusive kind of way ever again. I had made that promise to myself. And in that moment, as soon as I connected that dot and recognized what he just did was abusive, it was an abuse of power. I am not, I'm not, not taking responsibility for what I did, but what he did, I will not tolerate. And as soon as that piece came together for me, I just, was flooded with relief and knowing I knew exactly what I needed to do. So I stood up, flipped on the fluorescent, got all of my things together and left the building. And I submitted my two week notice. I said, I'm not staying. There's nothing, there's no, there's nothing compelling enough for me to stay in this situation. So I gave my two week notice. And, um, and as I was driving away that afternoon, just again, wanted to be clear of the space and the energy that just what didn't feel really right to me in that moment. The phone rang because I didn't have anywhere to go. It wasn't like I was like, oh, I'm just going to go take this job down the street. Like, no, it was literally in that moment. Like, I'm just going to unemploy myself rather than be in that space where I'm not valued as a, as a human. Like, it was really at that human level for me. So as I was driving away, I hadn't been in the car, not seven minutes left the parking lot, was about to pull onto the freeway, and my phone rang, and it was one of my brothers calling, and he was actually calling because it was October, it was fall, and so the weather was about to turn cold. I'm from the south, and so it wasn't cold yet, (laughs) and he was calling to say, hey, I just want to come over and check on things to make sure your house is ready for winter. Let's check the furnace. Let's make sure insulation. I was like, that's amazing. Thank you. I love you. I don't have time to talk to you right now. I need to find a job. He said, whoa, 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 slow down. Like what's happening. And so I told him what had just transpired. And I said, look, I, I need to just really kind of be in my head game right now and think about who I know and connections that I have so I can really identify what my next steps are professionally. And he said, well, maybe you and I should have a conversation about that. And that night he came over and he and I decided to go into business together (laughs) and we became business partners. And, um, anyway, the rest is kind of history. So he and I had a business together for like seven or eight years and it was amazing. And anyway, so there's all that, you know, there's so much to explore in that story. And I'm, I'm kind of disappointed that we're just focused on value because there's so much more to explore there. And another time, yes, another time. (laughs) I, I, have to, I have to share two things, though, that popped into my head 
as you told this story. And the first was, and, and I had to experience something similar before that light bulb went on for me was, it shouldn't have been you being embarrassed. He should have been embarrassed because all the other people that walked into the room, they weren't looking at you as if you had done something wrong. They were looking at him and going, he's messed up. That's messed up. So as I, as I walk away from situations like that, now I realize I'm not embarrassed by that. You should be really embarrassed by that. So that was the first thing that popped into my head. Yeah. And um, the next thing was that sense that you kind of freeze when things like that are happening. And I, I've done that. I had a, an abusive situation where I was in a small meeting room with two men and my laptop that they had taken off my desk to try to find some ammunition against me, which of course mm -hmm. there wasn't anything on it. Um, and I remember sitting in that little room and they are pummeling me with words about all the things I had done wrong, which of course, maybe one of the hour of laundry list had anything to do with me. And I could take responsibility for a handful of things, but what they were doing was absolutely abuse. And I remember sitting in that room and everything in me freezing and, and wanting to say something but being so appalled and shocked by this behavior that it wasn't until I walked away that, of course, oh, I should have said, or I could have said. And one of the things that actually ties back into this whole valuing yourself is practicing those words. And even more importantly, if you're one of those bystanders, saying something in the moment. Sure, and I'm, I really hear what you're saying. And I, and I think given the experience, having having been there <laughs> right right i had this Pee Wee herman remember the Pee Wee herman's movie at the end or he drives he leaves the drive-in movie he's like i don't need to see it i lived it <laughs> right? i love that <laughs> <laughs> I everyone think, i know has a big butt <laughs> uh, but i but i'm remembering in the moment i think yeah there was just this shock of like is this really happening am i standing here and this is actually happening and i never had a moment of oh, I should have said this, or I could have said that. It was never about that for me. It was simply, look, whatever his issue is, is his issue. And he just is projecting out loud all of that onto me. And, and for me, it was really truly about recognizing my own value. And my standing up for myself was my walking out of the building that day. And that was my way. I didn't need to go tit for tat with him about what was right or wrong and be in reverse judgment against him for, you know what, he's got his own issues. But for me, it's about owning and recognizing and valuing myself to where I was like, yeah, here's my boundary. And you just crossed it. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cross it. I'm gonna honor and acknowledge my boundary. So see ya. Wow. When we talked earlier, one of the things that we talked about in terms of value is where that value comes from internally. And I was immediately thrown back to this memory of working in a printing plant. When I was 13, I worked all summer long, basically full-time hours, because I was the daughter of the vice president of the printing plant. And it was probably on some level illegal, but I, I liked it because I was making money that I wouldn't have made anywhere else. And I think that part of how I have figured out my work ethic was a result of working in there. Um, it was a printing plant. So we're talking really very labor intensive, blue collar, not a highly educated workforce in there. And I was working, doing the same jobs a lot of these adults were doing. And I remember having to work twice as hard and be twice as efficient in order to get any respect or even nice treatment from the other employees. They knew I got my job from my dad because I I wouldn't have gotten a job at 13 anywhere else. But at the same time, they were kind of rude because it wasn't about the job. It was the fact that I was doing it. And I did that for three summers in a row. And by the last summer, I had earned a lot of respect from my coworkers because I worked just as hard as anyone else, if not harder. And it wasn't about what they were paying me. It wasn't about my hourly wage. That's not how I defined my value. It was about and, and it wasn't about what I was doing. It was about how I was doing it. I was doing it to the best of my ability. I was caring about it. It mattered to me. Even if I was just quality control checking 
those gigantic Hewlett Packard computer books to make sure none of the printing had gone off or the pages were tilted or anything. I cared about it. And I think that that's part of what has defined my work ethic now, which is pretty intensive. So I guess where I'm going with this is, can you think of a story where your worth or your value was defined by, by how you were doing something and not by what you were doing? It's a funny story and, and may not seem immediately relevant, but yes. Can I just respond to something in your story first though? Yes, of course. The word that comes to me as I'm listening to you, I hear you say, yeah, so my work ethic is really defined by this. The word though that actually feels more powerful to me is integrity. And I, I think it's, it, for me, that's what it's about. It's like, do I have integrity? Do I see myself as integrous? And, and how do I show up in the world versus it's, it isn't about what I do. It's how I do me. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've always told my daughter, that I tell myself, that I tell clients is we teach other people how to treat us. Mm -hmm. And we do that first by how we treat ourselves. And so this idea of simply showing up because it's the right thing to do, it's like, that's where we're putting in the hours. That's where we're putting, it's like, am I putting in the hours with myself? How do I see and experience myself? And if nobody else were looking, what would I be doing? And, and how I answer and respond to that, that's, that's my reflection. So I just, I, I love that. It's like, that's where we're, and, and it takes time to learn. I think, you know, we don't, we don't arrive knowing who we are. It just takes, it takes time. It takes experience. It takes um, moments, sometimes really painful, like the one that I shared earlier, like with, mm -hmm. with that former boss, or in your case, like with coworkers who maybe didn't see your value or respect you because they thought, oh, it's just about nepotism. When in your mind, it's like, I'm here doing a job. I'm here working because I value this. So here's a funny story. <laughs> I have a daughter. I've mentioned her reference to her a few times. Um, my daughter is now almost 20, but many years ago, she was not. She was little. And we had recently left. I had left her dad and relocated across the country and gone back home, back to North Carolina, where I'm from. And so she was maybe four years old. I don't even think she was four yet. So she was three and a half, four. And to be fair, there was a lot going on in her world, a lot of change, a lot. I mean, just so much you can appreciate that. And I had taken her to lunch or breakfast at a restaurant in order. I was having lunch with my former high school guidance counselor, loved this woman. So I had reconnected with her and was having a meal with her. After the meal, my daughter and I left the restaurant and came out to the parking lot to get into the car to go wherever we were going next. And my daughter, toddler, so little size, short, decided to just like run away from me and get to the car before me. But this is a parking lot. Right. Scary. And scary for me. Yes. Scary. And so I freaked out. And I mean, thankfully, there just nothing happened. But in my mind, I'm thinking all the things that could have happened. And, and so when I caught up with her, I was think in my mind, I'm just like racing through like, what do I do right now? Like I need to send her a lesson. I need to, you know, really be clear that this is not appropriate. This is not okay. And I just looked at her. <laughs> you can't even tell the story without laughing because it's so silly. Like I looked down at her and I was holding her by the wrist. I had kind of caught her as she's fleeing. If any of you have young children, you know, they tend to be like spaghetti, right? Uh -huh. um, and so she's yes. like, all arms and legs, like thinking this is a game. And I remember like being, grabbing her by the wrist. And in that moment, then I got to send a very powerful message to her that she's going to remember. And so I remember swatting her and saying, no, like this is not okay. And I swatted her and I think on her hand or wrist somewhere in there, like I swatted her to like kind of bring get her, her attention, get right. her attention, like, no. Now I want to say, this is the first time that I've, I've ever struck my child. I'd never done it before. And, um, and she just looked at me incredulously and busted out laughing. <laughs> oh no. And hit that was me back. not what you meant. Yeah. <gasps> she hit you back. <laughs> she hit me back. And she just like thought this was like hilarious. And in that moment, I just went, 
yeah, that's just not the way that I do it. And I, it's almost like I had caved into this pressure of what other people do. Like that must be the way to do it, but it's never been the way that I had done it. And, and in that moment, I thought, oh, I just released all of that pressure that I had put on myself of having to do it somebody else's way or thinking somebody else's way was better than mine. And the method is irrelevant and it's, I'm not here to judge that as right or wrong, but I recognized in that moment, this isn't my way. And it felt odd and uncomfortable and out of character and out of my integrity to have done that in the first place. And as soon as she laughed and hit me back, I just melted back into my authentic self as her mom. And I just got down on the pavement with her and just held her and talked to her and just shared with her what that experience had been for me and how scared I was. And anyway, it was this beautiful, I've never forgotten it because it was this lesson for me about how I do me. I have to trust and value that I know what is best for me. And it's just one of my favorite stories and memories that I share mm -hmm. with my daughter. And it is absolutely relevant for two reasons. One is recognizing that you can do you better than anyone else can. And, and the other is simply that you're modeling that behavior. And we, everything we do, our children see. Oh, so gosh. If we're disgusted by the behavior of our child, we really need to look in the mirror. Yeah. And it's, and it's uncomfortable and it kind of sucks. But if, excuse my language, but if it, I've seen this in parents with children and they complain about something about their child and I just kind of look at them and I, I want to, I want to turn the mirror on them and say, well, he's behaving that way because this is how he's seeing you behave. And um, as far as valuing yourself, he's not going to value you any more than you value you. So if a kid is being disrespectful to you, it's probably because you've been disrespectful to yourself in some way and definitely disrespectful to him as a child. A hundred percent, hundred percent. I like to remind my clients that outer experience is a reflection of inner reality. Mm -hmm. So to your, your words are, yeah, let's turn the mirror. Let's look at, yeah, where are you doing that to yourself? Where inside of you is, are you experiencing that? That mm -hmm. which you're judging is wrong. Exactly. It's fascinating too, because um, I think in terms of work ethic and that is, it's, it's all bundled in the word integrity, which is perfect. I'm so glad you brought that up and, and kind of, I won't say corrected, but guided that discussion to integrity. Because again, I, I'd like to come back to this idea that it's not what you're doing that provides that value. It's how you're doing it. It's how you're showing up. And whether you're working at Walmart or you're a, a, a city council member or whatever you're doing, no one's going to value you more than you value yourself. There are exceptions to that. I, couldn't, I shouldn't say no one because I know that as I was growing up, when I had those um, conflicting confidence issues, I know my mother, my father, I know my husband over the years have, have valued me more than I valued myself. But across the board, when you're talking about employers and customers, clients, they don't know you. And even if they do, they won't value you more than you can provide value by demonstrating it. Does well, that absolutely, yes. And I think, let me reference the, the story that I shared about the public berating. Mm -hmm. Like in an alternate universe, had I stayed in that job, what message would I be sending back to this, this man except... Yeah, please it's walk okay. all over me. It's, this is okay. Right. I accept this. I do this to myself all the time. So please, by all means, let's all pile on. And, and please, let's always leave the door open because I, I love public floggings. They're my favorite. That's the message that this is perfectly normal and acceptable behavior. And I buy into this misunderstanding that this is acceptable and normal. But I didn't do that because I value. So I modeled for myself first and, and for everybody else who was witness to that unfortunate display of smallness, that this is not acceptable. This isn't the way that, this isn't an appropriate or acceptable way um, to treat, certainly not me. 
you can treat yourself that way, but I won't, I'm out of my integrity if I say yes to this. And I have to jump back in there in that same story as um, those witnesses, especially the two women from the accounting department, witnessing that and watching you choose to leave, even without another job to go to, to say, I matter more than this. And that's not acceptable. I'm not going to tolerate it. You're right. I mean, when you model that kind of choice, choosing you, that does so much for our communities. And if more of us did that, I, I think more of us would be happier in our jobs. We would be happier in our lives across the board. And it's not just modeling for our children. We're modeling for every person that's witnessing what we're doing. And, and I love that you picked that up. I don't know if you did at that time. Did you know at that moment that you were modeling this when you no, walked out? No, and I don't, and, and let me be clear. I don't, I don't typically walk around thinking, who am I impressing today? And my, for whom am I modeling this behavior today? I think that's just a byproduct. That's a, right, that's a consequence. But no, it's really about staying in my own integrity. Byron Katie likes to say um, there are three businesses. There's my business, there's your business, and there's God's business. And God can be whatever. That's the universe. It's whatever. If you have a higher power or this, other, whatever, God's whatever you want it to be. But I, it, if I'm in my business, that's the only place I can be and let God do the rest. You do your business. I'll do mine and let God do the rest. And if I'm all up in your business, who's here minding and tending mine? Mm -hmm. Nobody. So for me, it's just about, am I in integrity with myself? And that's my gauge. That's my, that's my every day. That's my practice. If you will, it's like coming back to the breathing in a meditation practice It's a returning to the breath. It's a returning to my integrity. And it's never for me about who else saw that or am I, unless maybe it's my daughter. I sometimes think about that. Like, wow, it's more like an afterthought. Like, I wonder what she sees. Is she noticing this or is there something, maybe there's something here benefit for her, but it's like, it does, that's not what drives or informs my actions. It's really about me being clear in my authentic self and the way I show up because anything outside of that, Sarah, I am out of integrity with myself and the consequences. I mean, we could talk for a long time about mm -hmm. my experience, about how, how it feels when I'm out of integrity with myself and the ramifications of that physically, mm -hmm. mentally, emotionally, spiritually, professionally, um, there, it's just like kind of this ripple domino effect of negativity in my life when I'm out of integrity with myself. Did that answer your question? I feel like, yes. And um, I, I have to go back to this just for a moment because um, I do, I, I do completely agree that you, you have to bring you all the way and that informs everything you do. At the same time, I, I tell people that being intentional is really important. And if you're being intentional about being you, you are modeling that. Oh, hundred percent. And, and even if it's not, I would hope that it's not, oh, I wonder who's watching me. It's more about, I know people are watching. I know, I know that people are observing what's going on around them in best case scenario. Um, and so being intentional about being your true self is so important and also we could even go back further than that and say, what is your true self? What values do you embody? And integrity is all part of that, embodying the values and, and knowing what's true to yourself. So I, I love that you brought that up because I, I think if more people recognized what their values really are and thought about them with intention, then we could be that more. We could know we're bringing our whole selves to to every environment because we don't know that unless unless we know those values so it kind of goes back to this whole understanding who we are what drives us what we're going to tolerate what we won't tolerate and valuing ourselves for what we bring to the table what we know we bring oh, I, love I love it. that I love it and it's so beautiful and I think I, I'm not disagreeing with anything you're saying I think just for me I'm aware of it. It's, it's, it's more like that's a, that's a byproduct of me staying in my own integrity. If this mm -hmm. is a benefit to someone else, great, but I'm not in their business. I'm not, right. it's not my journey. It's not my curriculum. This is, 
I am who I am and where I am and I'm showing, I'm doing me in the best way that I know how. The one thing that I'm an expert on is me. That's mm -hmm. it. Not on you. I don't know what was going through the minds of those women sitting on that sofa. I can't know that. I don't need to know that. Um, did they get impacted? Were they, I'm sure that they were, but this was about me honoring, making a self-honoring choice. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's what I return to. What is the best choice for me, given what I know and understand in this moment? And ever, you know, honestly, that's kind of a big incident, but life every day, it's made up of the small moments. And it really is for me and my experience. It's what am I doing when nobody else is watching? Mm -hmm. What are the choices that I'm making? Am I making self-honoring choices? Am I honoring and acknowledging and staying in my integrity with myself every day. Mm -hmm. And wow, the, the ripple effect of that is just extraordinary. And me being me, when I do that, there's no way, no way I want to be anybody else or any place else because my experience of being myself, I love it. I love it's it. Liberating. It is. And that, that's the freedom. And then from that just flows everything else. I'm able to serve others and give and show up um, in support of others because I'm staying in integrity with myself, because I value Arminda. I value who I am and what I'm doing. And wow, it's taken me years to really, I say, really solidly be standing in this space. And I wouldn't trade any of the learning for where I am and who I am today. Which leads me right back and a perfect segue into our conclusion. The way you tell yourself that story of stepping out and choosing yourself is part of what makes you the server that you are today, that you can serve other people in the way that you do because the way you tell yourself the story is perfectly complemented by the way you're telling the story, sharing it with me and with our listeners. And I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that, that trust and gift that you give. So thank you. And thank um, you. I'm looking forward to doing this again, maybe in a few months or a year and, and see where we go with it the next time we talk about it. Beautiful. I'm in. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for listening to Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Share Them Will. Please visit my website for more podcast episodes, blog posts, and information about how I can help you develop and share your stories at elkinsconsulting.com.